Um, and markets are like, we're not going to bring in local species that those aren't going to sell. Um, and so someone has to take kind of the first risk. Um, and from a consumer point of view, it's a lot less of a risk for you to say, I want local um, and name a different local species than it is for a retail market or a restaurant to bring in a large volume of that species and then not have it sell. Um, and so what I'm hoping is by introducing you guys to some of these local species that we could be eating more of, um, that you guys start requesting them. Walk into your local market or your local restaurant, ask them what's local and order that species. Or if they don't have lo you know, local species, ask them for some of these a different species and create that demand. So starting with some of the shellfish, and again, there's over a hundred different species that are landed in New England waters um, that we could be eating. These are just a few of them, and I'm gonna go through a bunch of them, but they're not all of them. So there's a whole lot more that we could be trying. And also not all of them are actually being harvested right now in huge commercial levels. And so they can be really hard to find, but that's why we need to kind of create demand for them. Um, and so, I think this middle picture you guys probably recognize the most. Um, that it, the one on the top middle, those are quahogs. Um, I hope that most people on Block Island know what a quahog is. These are hard shell clams. You might see them in your retail market as little necks or cherry stones or chowder clams. Uh, they're all the same species, but just different size categories. And a great local species. These are all filter feeders. Um, they're pretty abundant. I feel like Rhode Island state shellfish is the quahog. Um, so We've got quahogs in the middle. Um, below that are scallops. If you don't know what scallops look like in the shell, um, this is what a sea scallop looks like. So they're typically harvested um, with dredges um, and you get Block Island sea scallops, which are really tasty. Um, but what you eat typically on the sea scallop is the abductor muscle that's kind of in the middle there. Um, below or on the bottom corner, um, on the right-hand side, those are bay scallops. So you guys might see those out here in the winter time. Um, typically is when the season for those are. Um, bay scallops are super sweet. Um, they are like candy, <laughs> like ocean candy. Um, and another species that is very seasonal, they um, have a very short lifespan. Um, and so they, they're a species that actually relies on eelgrass beds. Um, as a habitat. And so we've seen a decline in, in bay scallops over the years. Um, and that's a huge part due to declining of eelgrass beds. And so it just shows the importance of habitat um, for these different species. But um, bay scallops, when they're available in the winter season, are a special treat. Um, above the bay scallops is razor clams. Um, these are fun species that you typically only see on menus or in the markets at the corresponding with the either the new moon or the full moon. And that's because they're only really available to harvest at the lowest low tides. Um, and so it's more about when the fishermen can actually access them um, in terms of availability. Above that is surf clams. Um, they're harvested on a commercial level with actually fairly really big boats um, that will dredge them. But you can also harvest them closer to shore. Um, I see them wash up on the beaches all the time um, in Middletown, Rhode Island, I know, um, after a big storm, particularly in the winter. And so they definitely do grow closer to shore. Um, but on a commercial level, they're typically harvested on fairly large boats with a dredge offshore. Um, across from that, on the other corner, on the left-hand corner, is periwinkles. Not a lot of people realize you can actually eat periwinkles, but they're really delicious. Um, typically, where I actually see them is available in like Asian markets or Portuguese markets. Um, but they're really tasty. You can steam them with like herbs, garlic, butter, a uh, little white wine, and they're delicious. Um, eat them with like a toothpick. Um, you can also just steam them in some salt water and they're tasty that way too. Um, below that is slipper limpets. This is a personal favorite species. Um, we've been trying to promote slipper limpets at e eating with the ecosystem for a while. Um, these are caught a lot of times when the cohoggers are harvesting cohogs um, and they coat kind of the top surface of the bud. So they have to dig through the slipper limpets to get to the cohogs. Um, and most of the time they just throw them back because there's not much of a market for them. But we've been trying to promote them because they're absolutely delicious. We've served them in a couple of our um, dinners and events. One of the ones that George mentioned was our community dinner um, this past February. Um, and we served slipper limpets at that. And it was a, definitely a popular um, dish and a popular species. So 
definitely recommend those. And then below that is softshell clams or steamer clams. They're definitely a species that is um, being impacted by climate change, particularly in, um, both with their ability to build a shell, but also predation, um, particularly with green crabs. So you guys are enjoying some green crab bisque tonight. Um, green crabs, talk a little about, but they're an invasive species. Um, and they originally came over from Europe um, and they're pretty aggressive crabs. Um, they reproduce really quickly and they love to feed on soft shell clams. Um, as well as outcompete native species like our native rock crabs and Jonah crabs, um, as well as lobsters, even when they're juveniles for food. Um, and so they're at our bottom. They're really delicious. Um, as you can tell from the best, they have a lot of really flavorful crab flavor. Um, at the top left hand corner, we also have blue mussels. Um, those are a great filter feeding organism. Most of the time, when you do see them, they're a farm species. Um, which is totally fine. It's a very sustainable way of um, farming. A lot of um, bivalve aquaculture or um, shellfish aquaculture is very sustainable within New England. So we've got some very cool mussel farms that are happening. Um, below that is lobsters. I don't think I have to introduce that species probably to anyone out here. Lobster is a longtime fishery um, in New England um, and a species that's been, that is generally fairly popular. <laughs> In the middle on the top, we've got squid. Um, that's a picture of longfin squid or lolago squid. Um, that is a very quintessential Rhode Island species. Um, calamari is our state appetizer. So if you haven't had it, I, I'd be surprised. Um, but there's a lot of other ways to enjoy squid beyond fried, um, in case you guys haven't tried it yet. So I love it grilled. Um, it's a great sauteed. Um, you can, it's good in ceviche. You can do a lot with squid. Um, so if you don't love a fried squid, I totally, I recommend trying some of these other preparation methods because you can definitely, you can stuff it with sausage or other um, flavors and braise it and cook it in like, you know, low and slow and these like red sauce or all kinds of different options for preparing it. Below that are sand crabs or rock crabs. Um, and then over in the middle right hand side are Jonah crabs. They're both very similar species. They're both cancer crabs, um, but they, um, and they both have this really sweet kind of delicate flake. Um, and they catch them typically in lobster traps. Um, so for the lobstermen in Southern New England, they become increasingly important species as lobster populations have declined. Um, the crab pop, um, populations have been really important in terms of sustaining that fishery. Um, above that, we've got sea urchins, which the part of the sea urchin that you eat is called the gonads, or um, you'll see it on sushi menus as uni. Um, so you may have enjoyed it before. It makes a really um, flavorful like pasta sauce. Um, uni butter is really delicious, or you can just eat it plain and raw um, or on toast. Really tasty. Um, and then on the bottom right-hand corner are whelks. Um, that's a channeled whelk. We also have knobbed whelks, um, which is another species that you probably have found the shell of around here. They have little bumps on the shell. Um, they're a fairly um, meaty, tough kind of species. You have to um, either kind of pressure cook them for a while or low and slow for a while, um, but they create a really delicious kind of sweet shellfish flavor um, that they'll use in a lot of times in Italian cuisine in what they call scongeli. Um, which is like a snail salad. Um, but it's also used actually in Asian cuisine a lot and they'll prepare it in a bunch of different ways, some different stir fries and things. Um, and then in Caribbean um, cultures, you can use these types of whelks um, in very similar ways that you would use palm. Um, so you can make fritters, for example, or um, pound it and fry it and make crack conch. Um, and so you'll hear the fishermen a lot of times refer to the whelks as conchs. Um, but are the species that we have here, which are technically whelks. Um, you guys know the difference between a whelk and a conch? I figure we're a beanie, so maybe. <laughs> um, so whelks are actually carnivorous. Um, so they'll eat other, like, other animals, um, whereas the conch are actually herbivorous. Um, so they'll eat things like algae. Um, and so that would basically be the difference. Otherwise, they're pretty similar, big snails. <laughs> Moving into some of our fin fish. Um, so our top left-hand corner, that's butterfish. 
these are another of some of my favorite species. Um, as you can see from the pictures, they're about the size of the palm of your hand. So they're not very large. One of the things that we try to um, get people to do at eating with the ecosystem is actually eat whole fish. When you are willing to eat a whole fish, first of all, you're getting a lot more bang for your buck. From a financial standpoint of view, it makes a whole lot more sense. From a sustainability point of view, it also makes a whole lot of more sense because you're getting, you're utilizing the whole animal. You're getting all the meat that is possibly can come off of it. And then also it opens up a whole world of species for you. Um, Butterfish are not typically, as you can see from their size, going to be filleted too often. Um, so if you're willing to eat a whole fish, um, you'll get to enjoy butterfish along with a whole bunch of other different types of species. Um, and it's not super hard. To, I feel like one of the things that we've been trying to do at Central River Events is actually serve the whole fish and show people how to eat, actually eat the whole fish and get the meat off the bones without getting a mouthful of bones. And there's definitely technique to it. Um, if you grew up in a culture where whole fish is something that's very normally served. It's come second nature to you. Um, but I think for most Americans, that's not necessarily the case. Um, and so trying to introduce people to that scale is something that we're working on. Um, below that is whiting. Um, these are another one of our kind of most hot species here in Rhode Island. Um, super abundant. Um, we catch a lot of them and yet you very rarely see them kind of on markets or in menus. Um, and I see a few people making faces. Whiting when it's at, whiting when you have had it and it's not super fresh, it's kind of mushy um, and doesn't really hold together that well. Whiting when it's fresh and well taken care of is one of the best tasting fish you'll ever eat. It's incredibly sweet. Um, it is very delicate. So you do have to be careful in terms of handling it because it is a softer textured fish. Um, but they're actually related to things like cod and haddock. Um, and so they have a very pure white flesh. Um, they're very sweet in flavor. Um, and yeah, a, a whiting that's like, they call it like last trawl whiting because typically they're, they're trawl caught fish, but the ones that have not been mushed at the bottom of the fish bucket, um, absolutely amazing. Um, and so <laughs> I highly recommend them if you get a chance to try them and they do come in different sizes. Most of the whiting that you see are about a foot long. Uh, maybe a little bit longer, and so typically served whole again. Um, in Spain, they call them merluza. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. My pronunciation isn't great. Um, but they'll fry them whole, and like it looks like they put the tail in the mouth. They fry them whole, and it looks like a little donut. Um, but um, and you'll also get king whiting, which is the larger ones. You can actually get a size to lay it off of, um, and super tasty fish. Um, below that is black sea bass. Um, this is a species that I feel like if you're a recreational fisherman around here, you've probably caught before um, or at least seen. Um, these guys have increased in abundance with climate change and with warmer water temperatures. And so we see a lot of black sea bass now. Um, and if you guys have checked out the tanks out back <laughs> um, here at Mimi, they're pretty aggressive fish. Um, they probably have the black sea bass kind of kept separate from a lot of the other crabs or other fish because they will eat everything, um, including juvenile lobsters and crabs, um, other small fish, other black sea bass, even um, squid, whatever you can find. And so um, these guys have moved into our water, but they have a nice, you guys got an example actually at tonight with both the pata and the ceviche, but nice white flesh to them, um, really kind of sweet flavor because they're eating so much of that crustacean. I think it kind of comes through in the flavor of the flesh. So Black sea bass are really tasty and uh, what we refer to as a climate winter species, at least within our region, they're kind of increasing in abundance in our area. Uh, the top middle, we've got pollock. Um, I think pollock used to always get really, really bad rap for being what people referred to as like a trash fish. Pollock is in the same family as cod and haddock. So if you like a flaky white fish, pollock is absolutely delicious. And in many times, actually, I think sometimes tastier than some of those other species. Um, so really good. Um, again, I think people's perceptions of species have changed kind of over the years. At one time, lobster was considered food to be fed to prisoners. Um, and now I think we can all agree that it's a delicacy um, and on menus as a quite high priced item. Um, and so it's really about our perception as consumers kind of and what we value as a species. And so if you like a flaky white fish, um, and a nice size fillet. Pollock is a great option. Um, below that is Acadian redfish. Um, these guys look almost like a snapper. 
um, and have a nice like flaky white filet with a beautiful red skin that also kind of looks like a snapper. Um, you can cook it similarly. Um, they are great for fish tacos or anything that you want kind of like a smaller chunk of fish for. They're really good in ceviche or that kind of thing. Um, then below that, the big picture on the bottom, those are scup or corgi. I feel like in Rhode Island, we call them scup. In Connecticut and elsewhere, they call them corgi. Um, these are another eating with the ecosystem favorite species um, because they're so versatile. Um, I think scup are another ones that get somewhat of a bad rap because if you go fishing and you catch them, they're pretty easy to catch. And maybe you're targeting a different species and you weren't so happy to catch scup. But scup, despite being a smallish fish, you can do so much with them. They're perfect size for a whole fish meal. Um, so if you want to grill a whole fish or roast or bake a whole fish, these guys are like perfect for it. Um, they also are one of my favorite fish to eat raw in like a crudo or like a poke bowl type situation. Um, they have a little bit more flavor than like a black sea bass or something like that. Um, and but they aren't like if you look at their flesh, it's kind of pinkish in color, right? Um, it's not as dark as like a tuna or something, but it still has a little bit more oil and flavor to it um, that I think makes it like such a great raw fish um, that you can actually kind of taste that sweetness. Um, and yeah, they make like a great fish taco or like a, one of the um, chefs that we work with, he runs a food truck um, in like on Aquidneck Island called Little Fish. And Scup is one of the species all the time for his fish tacos um, because it's just a perfect fish taco fish. Um, but yeah, you could do so much with Scup. I highly recommend um, if you need recipes, we've got a lot of them. Um, and then the top right corner, those are skate. A lot of times um, people don't realize that you can eat skate, but skate is delicious. In other cultures, it's super popular, including in France. It's like a specialty in France. Um, if you go to France and eat them, like look at some of the menus, skate is really prevalent. Um, piccata, like you guys had the black sea bass um, tonight. Um, is a great way to prepare it. So brown butter, capers, little lemon, parsley, um, super simple. I think skate has almost the flavor of scallops. Um, so really sweet kind of in flavor and then a completely different texture than any other fish. Um, so the way that it flakes on like a typical fish, you have those vertical flakes, right? Like you see in a cod or haddock or straight bass, something like that. Um, on a skate, it flakes out almost like the um, fingers on your hand. Um, and so it flakes out horizontally. Um, and so very unique texture that's kind of like meaty and stringy sort of um, with this sweet scallop-like flavor um, that's super easy to prepare. Um, most of the time, if you are finding skate at a market, it's been filleted for you. Um, so you're not seeing the whole skate typically um, or just the wing typically, you're seeing kind of just a filet. And so all you have to do is throw it in a pan with some butter and you're good to go. Um, Below that is cod. A lot of times I had included cod because not because people don't know what cod is. Everybody knows what cod is. But a lot of times people ask us, you know, it, it, it's a local species. Should we be eating cod or should we not be eating cod? For us, cod can be part of our local diet because it's part of our local ecosystem. Should it be the fish that we're eating every single time we eat fish? No. Cod is not super abundant in our ecosystems anymore. It might one day return. That would be a great goal. Um, but right now, based on the way things are going in terms of climate change and other things, I don't see cod returning in huge abundances anytime soon. So right now, cod can be part of a diet. It's a smaller part of a diet. So it's, it's part of our diet alongside these more abundant species like scup, like whiting, like butterfish, et cetera. Um, below that um, is cunner. I know it's a small picture. Um, I included it because you guys are on a block island. And I feel like you guys have a fair amount of recreational fishermen in the room. It's not harvested on a commercial level in any great abundance, but if you like to tog, um, cunner are related to tog. They're really sweet in flavor. Um, they're absolutely delicious, and you can get some decent sized cunner, and I highly recommend keeping them and eating them if you get the chance. Um, so next page, sea robin. Those are another one of our favorite species. Um, and I see a few people kind of like hiding their eyes or laughing. Sea robin are absolutely delicious. Um, they are in other parts of the world, again, Europe and France, they're called gunard. Um, and that's like the quintessential fish that you use in bouillabaisse. Um, and so 
it's got a meaty texture not quite as meaty as like a monkfish or something like that but it's got a nice meaty texture it holds together well so if you're cooking it in like a broth or stock or something like that it actually is going to hold together versus break apart and flake apart like a cod would um, it's got a super sweet kind of almost like shellfishy flavor to it um, similar kind of I guess to the black sea bass but a little sweeter even um, and they're really delicious and you can catch a lot of them <laughs> um, so Highly recommend trying. They're also really good raw crudo, ceviche, anything like that. Um, and they're great as a whole fish. One of our dinners, we served them as a, as a smoked sea robin tail. Um, and that was one of the most popular dishes of the night um, for like all the guests. So highly recommend playing around with sea robin. Um, one of our board members is uh, the chef at Shipwright's Daughter in Mystic, Connecticut. Um, his name's David Standridge, and he just won um, James Beard, best chef in the Northeast. Um, and Sea Robin is one of the species he serves on his menu on a regular basis. And he like asks for it. He, like he asks some of the local fishermen that he works with in terms of harvesting. He's like, can you get me more Sea Robin? <laughs> um, and so, um, yeah, highly recommend it. It's definitely an underappreciated fish in our region. Um, below that is dogfish. You guys have a few out in the tank out here. Um, Dogfish, there's two different species, both spiny and smooth dogfish. Um, I would say they're a very like underappreciated fish. Um, again, if you're going fishing, you probably have caught dogfish before, maybe without intending to. Um, but they actually can be really delicious. They can also be really gross. Like, I'm not going to lie to you. <laughs> dogfish are a type of shark. They do like pee through their skin. And so if you do not handle that fish correctly and actually bleed it and ice it and treat it like a fish that you're going to eat, then it, yes, it's going to taste not so great. It's going to taste like a trash fish. Um, but if you bleed the fish, handle it well, put it, slush, ice it, put it on ice, it can be a beautiful fish. Um, and we have a couple different um, like fishermen that we work with, as well as restaurants that we work with that serve dogfish on a regular basis. It's a great fish and chips fish. Um, they always say like over in England or Scotland and Europe, if you've had fish and chips in the UK, there's a good chance you've had dogfish. It was a very popular fish to use in fish and chips over there for a very, very long time and still is. Um, but yeah, dogfish is apt to do more with it than just fry it. Also, we've served it in curries. Um, we've done it in powder to can sear it. So you can do a lot with it. Um, we were fishing actually out at Block Island yesterday with a group of fishermen um, and the boat the captain of whose boat we were on he took home two smooth dogfish those were the fish that he chose to take home um, to his family yesterday so they're they can be really beautiful and really delicious so i but you got to actually handle it well and treat it well um, it's one that definitely um does, you, you notice a huge difference with like good handling practices with dogfish some other species like handling practices don't aren't quite as important i would say always ice your fish just from a food safety point of view um but like one of the reasons things like cod became so popular, I would say, is because we didn't used to have great technology in terms of refrigeration and food handling and all of that. And it, that fish does do better um, in those type of circumstances, whereas dogfish definitely does not. So I used your fish um, and it will be delicious. Um, Above that, um, we've got yellowtail flounder in the top um, basket, and then we have fluke kind of in the middle here. Um, there's so many different types of flounders that we have here in New England. I think there's about at least six different types. Um, uh, fluke or summer flounder is the only one that you're going to have as a left-facing flounder. The, all the rest are right-facing flounders. So there's things like gray sole, American dab, um, or American plate and dabs. Um, and then there's um, like winter flounder, um, all kinds of different species. They all tend to be very flaky, mild, delicate white fish. And in terms of culinary use, you can really interchange them. Um, you can do anything, you know, with a flaky, mild white fish that you want. Um, very versatile. Fluke, I would say, is the only one that is slightly different. You can kind of take to a next level. Because you, if you look at them, their mouths are much larger than, like, the other types of flounders. They're a much more aggressive predator. If you fish for them, you probably have realized that. Um, they have a little bit more of a meaty texture, I would say, than some of the other flounders, so not quite as delicate. Um, and you can actually, they get larger in size also, um, and you can serve them raw also. So sushi-grade fluke is something that's very popular. Um, and so 
guys are are pretty cool on that level. Um, above the I guess the other middle picture um, on the top, that's haddock. Um, so a classic quintessential New England species that I feel like is in a lot of fish and chips. Uh, next one over is bluefish. Again, recreational fishermen around here have probably experienced bluefish. Um, they're super aggressive predators, um, and so they're also very fast high energy fish. And so if you notice that a lot of other fast, high energy fish are things like mackerel, like the fish below it, um, tuna, um, and they all tend to be darker meat fish. Um, so there's a lot of blood that flows through them. Um, all those fish also tend to really benefit from bleeding and icing. <laughs> um, and so um, bluefish, similar to the dogfish, if you don't handle it properly, it's gonna taste kind of fishy and gross. Um, if you handle bluefish properly, it's a beautiful fish. Um, it, I think a lot of times is really known for smoking. So it does really well with a, like a smoke, which is really tasty, but I love a grilled blue fish. I've even tried it raw. Um, so if a uh, blue fish crudo was one of the first ways I had it when I moved to Rhode Island and I was blown away. It was absolutely delicious. It was at a restaurant called Oberlin in Providence. Um, so blue fish can be a beautiful, really great fish, but again, it really benefits from proper handling. Um, below that is mackerel. I would say same thing. It falls to that category of definitely needing to be properly handled. Um, we were catching mackerel yesterday. There's been a lot of mackerel around mackerel in the tank out there. You guys can go and check out. Um, but there are schooling fish. They eat plankton. Um, if you want to eat sustainably and eat like, you know, towards the bottom of the food chain, ma the mackerel are taking the harvesting the energy that's coming out of like plankton kind of level and helping them feed higher up in the food chain. And they're delicious species for us. They're really full of omega-3s and really good for you. This is my last side of fish, I promise. <laughs> um, but uh, Tatog is the top left-hand corner. Um, these guys are one of my favorite like eating fish personally. I think they're incredibly delicious. I My favorite seafood species is lobster. Um, I grew up in Southern Maine. Um, and Tatog eat a lot of like crabs lobster and I think it has that same sweet flavor to it um, and so these guys are great they are a longer living fish um, they take a long time to mature and reproduce and so they're one that we it's important to have regulations in place to help protect them so you continue to have them for future populations but uh, but yeah they're really delicious um, typically the you know harvest season for them is either fall or spring uh, Below that, you've got two different types of tuna, although we have other types of tuna as well. We've got both yellowfin tuna in that picture as well as bluefin tuna, but there's big eye tuna, there's albacore tuna, um, all kinds of different um, tuna that are caught around here. In recent years, it seems like there's been a lot of bluefin tuna caught pretty close to shore. Um, and I'm not 100% sure why that is, but they think actually that's part of it is like good conservation measures and good you know, fisheries regulations that are helping to bring back the tuna kind of in our area. And I think oh, tuna for a long time, particularly bluefin tuna, got a bad rap in terms of sustainability as being something that you should avoid. Um, and the Atlantic bluefin tuna that's caught within New England is incredibly highly regulated. Um, and fishermen have been having a hard time in recent years actually selling the fish they're catching and actually getting decent prices for it because of that um, you know, the story that people have been telling for a long time to try to protect it. Um, and so I think it's important to keep up with those changes and celebrate when the, there's a success story and the fisheries are doing a good job. Um, and so it's that I think honey now, again, not a species that we need to eat every single day. It's not, you know, in that abundance yet. We should still be eating some of these more abundant species like scuffs and et cetera. But I think we can eat tuna, especially when it's in season in our area. Uh, above that at the top, um, kind of middle is John Dory. Um, it's a very funny looking fish. Um, these guys are caught in really deep water. Um, a lot of times from squid boats as bycatch. Um, there's not a ton known about them. They're kind of a mysterious fish, but super tasty. Their fillets almost look like a chicken, <laughs> like, a ch like a chicken breast. Um, they're kind of meaty in texture. They hold together well, um, sweet in flavor um, and a nice like white fish. I would compare it kind of in flavor almost a hell of it, uh, maybe. Uh, but yeah, really cool fish that people are not necessarily super aware of. Uh, below that, that really ugly looking guy, um, <laughs> that is monkfish. 
Um, these guys, despite their ugly appearance, are delicious. Um, they're they used to be called poor man's lobster because their tail is kind of a lobster tail like texture, and they do have this sweet flavor. And if you poach it in butter, you definitely get a lobster like um like dish out of it. Um, we've served monkfish rolls before that have been like lobster rolls that are really delicious. Um, but you could do a lot more with monkfish than try to get lobster. Um, you can serve i think it's delicious in its own right it holds together so well so if you actually want to have a fish in like a fish stew like a portuguese fish stew or a chowder or something like that monkfish is the perfect fish for that it's a really forgiving fish for a home cook that maybe is not super experienced at pan searing something um and have it i feel like they it holds together well you don't have to worry about it flaking apart and falling apart in your pan or grilling it you can grill it you can do monkfish kebabs um, super versatile. The one thing I would say for a tip for cooking monkfish is make sure you remove the membrane from the outside of the flag. A lot of times people don't realize that, but there's this what they call the silver skin or membrane that's on the outside of the flag uh, that's different than the dark, dark brown skin that's on the outside of the fish. Um, and you have to remove that membrane or else it just tightens up when you cook it and it gets really tough. But if you remove that membrane with just like a normal sharp knife, cut it off, um, or if you have kitchen scissors, you can also use that. Um, then it's absolutely delicious, really tender, uh, and really good. If you've had monkfish and haven't enjoyed it, it's probably because it was cooked with the membrane. Um, uh, next up, that's Spanish mackerel on the, I guess, right-hand top um, middle section. Um, these are species that have been increasingly moving into our waters with warmer water temperatures. Um, they're kind of a medium-flavored fish. Um, they hold up well to like a blackened seasoning or that kind of thing, a little more flavor um, to it, uh, but really delicious and tasty and moving up kind of from the cell for temperatures. Um, triggerfish is below that. That one's also one that we're seeing more and more of um, with warmer water temperatures. Um, so sometimes you'll catch them around here in the summer. Um, these guys are kind of cool. They're a pain to fillet. Their skin is very tough, um, but the fillet itself is beautiful and delicious, um, it, or you can cook it whole and then peel the skin right off. Um, and nice and meaty, kind of sweet, similar, I guess, in flavor to the John Dory. And I would say similar in texture to the John Dory as well, kind of meaty and um, holds together well, but yeah, nice and sweet in flavor. On the top um, left hand, right hand corner, those are golden tilefish. These are another deep water um, kind of species. Um, they're kind of cool. Uh, they're Kind of, again, medium texture, sweet in flavor, white fish. Um, and then below that, those are bonito. Um, we also have things like um, like, like skipjack tuna or like uh, <laughs> false albacores and stuff like that. But those are bonito. They are, bonitos are delicious. Um, they're great, like, raw fish. They're, it's like a small tuna, basically. Um, they definitely, again, definitely benefit from bleeding and handling properly, putting on ice. But really delicious fish. Also, if you've had bonito flakes um, at like, you know, Asian restaurants or sushi, like that's bonito. That's where that comes from. And so that's just, they, they dry the fish um, and then they shave it. Uh, and so that's where that comes from. All right. So we're moving on to the last kind of part um, to talk about the rest of the anchors. Um, but I wanted to spend a while, a while on the, uh, the symmetry anchor just to introduce you guys to the full variety of species. But our third anchor is adaptability. So instead of just eating one or two local species, we want you to diversify your diet and eat in balance with the ecosystem. That's our whole symmetry thing. And adaptability is our ecosystems are constantly changing. Um, you've heard me mention climate change multiple times. There's all seasonal changes that we experience. And we think as sustainable consumers, we should be changing our diets with those ecosystem changes to help those ecosystems and those fishing communities adapt. So black sea bass is kind of like the poster child here for climate change in our region. It's really, populations used to be centered around like North Carolina, Virginia, and now they're really right around here. Um, and so there are species we can be kind of eating more of um, and helping the ecosystems as well as the fisheries adapt. Um, we've been working on a couple different projects related to climate change and fisheries. One is our climate resilient seafood supply chains project where we've been interviewing seafood businesses from all around New England on um, their ability to incorporate what we're considering climate into their business models and what they need to actually incorporate these species. 
And for us, climate winter species are species that are predicted to either move into our region or increase in abundance in our region um, or help kind of mitigate the impacts of climate change. So we see here kelp as one of the species, um, sugar kelp, it can actually help trap for carbon in the atmosphere. Uh, but also in terms of other climate winter species, things like black sea bass, climate winter species for us, um, green crabs <laughs> increasing in abundance and by eating them, we're helping kind of communities adapt, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of different that, that are included kind of with that. Our fourth anchor is connectivity. Um, so for us, it's really important that we're not just eating a wide variety of species and be like, great, we did it, we're, we're, we're sustainable. It's really important to take care of the habitats that are actually producing our seafood. So whether you're a vegetarian and don't eat any seafood at all, this is an anchor that you can actually participate in. Um, taking care of your marine ecosystems is something that we can all do. Um, and that can be, you know, actually taking part in restoration, habitat restoration work or supporting policies that help support healthy marine ecosystems. It can also be using more biodegrading middle cleaning products in your own homes or not using chemical fertilizers or pesticides on your lawns that all ends up washing into the ocean. I think there's a lot that goes into taking care of kind of our ecosystems um, and something that I think as a sustainable consumer, whether you eat seafood or not, is something we can all kind of participate in. And then our last anchor is community. Um, we sometimes refer to this one as knowing your fishermen, but really community-based fisheries enhance the social, the cultural, the ecological fabric of our communities. Um, and we think it's something that we should really come together around and celebrate. For us, there's a lot of heritage around eating seafood. Um, there's a lot of culture around eating seafood and there's a lot of really important fishing communities um, within our region that we should be supporting. And so when we're eating local seafood, you're supporting the, everybody that touched that seafood before it got to your plate, whether it was the ice maker or the seafood dealer that offloaded it or the fisherman that caught it or the fish market that maybe sold it to you. Um, it's, I think it's important to support your community. Um, and so this is an important part of sustainability for us. Um, and we get asked a lot about where does aquaculture fit in? Our mission is place-based approach to sustaining New England's wild. Um, aquaculture also fits into our work. Uh, we have a couple different criteria. One is that it's small to medium scale, but basically not industrial. Um, it's community-based um, and it has a positive benefit on the environment. Um, so things like oyster farms or shellfish farms, they are filter feeders. They help keep the water within your local area. Uh, they help provide habitat for all these native species. Those are great positive environmental benefits. Kelp farming, we mentioned, helps capture carbon from the atmosphere. Um, great positive benefits. And are all happening at the small to medium scale, community kind of based level. So for us, that's where aquaculture fits in. Large scale industrial fish farms in, in most cases have not fit into kind of our mission at this point. In terms of what we do, um, we do a lot of education and outreach research, um, supply chain facilitation, like helping chefs and restaurants connect with um, seafood businesses and fishermen selling fish, um, these different underutilized species. We do a lot of marketing, um, events, connections and relationship building, um, and we create a lot of resources. We have a whole website with a whole recipes page if anybody's looking for recipes. We also have a cookbook. I bought a few of them that are in the back um, that I can sell to people if people are interested at the end. It's called Simmering RC, and it has recipes for all things like slipper limpets and sea robin and skate that you might not find at your typical cookbook. Um, we work with a wide variety of people, everything from seafood eaters to chefs and restaurants, fishers, harvesters, seafood businesses, markets, researchers, food systems planners, policy makers. If it interacts with the seafood world, we're interacting with them. Um, and we've got a couple upcoming events that I wanted to share with you guys. Um, we've got a drinking with the ecosystem event coming up on July 25th. <laughs> um, we're partnering with the Industrious Spirits Company. Called, also the name is ISCO. Um, they're in Providence. Um, they have a really cool oyster vodka as well as a Seaflow gin that uses oysters and kelp. Um, so we're excited to partner with them. There's gonna be cocktails, there's gonna be an oyster raw bar and some other seafood snacks provided by um, Kwani Fish Co. Um, so we're excited for that. If you guys come off island, we would love to have you up in Providence. Um, and then we also have a big event, big fundraiser event for us um, called Fishes at the Port. Um, which is August 18th in Newport at Port Adams. And we've got a multi-course seafood meal with four different chefs, 
um, including David Standard from The Shipwright's Daughter, Josh Berman from Little Fish, Sky Kim from Gift Horse, um, and Jason Timothy from Troop, who are going to put together this multi-course delicious dinner for us. Um, so really excited about that. You can find more information about all these events on our website. So I think questions, George, is that, do you have time for some? Yeah, in the middle, back. So tell me again what you're finding. You're finding just like the middle of the skate. But no wings attached, just the middle. Yeah, that would be because the fish. Are, so skate when they're harvested are harvested typically through either gill net or trawl. Um, and they're fairly big, like fish. Um, and so the part of the skate that they utilize is the wings. Um, and so on board in order to save space, the fishermen will cut the wings off, and that's what they bring into the fish, the dealer, and then they do throw the um like the middle part overboard. Um, and so I don't ever see those washing up when I'm in like the mainland, like in Middletown, Newport, but you guys being on a block Island, that would make sense. Um, that's, that's why it is. Yeah. Um, other questions? Oh, sorry. I should have repeated the question. Um, it was, why does like the, um, carcass, I guess the middle part of the skate wash up on the beaches out here? Any other questions? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I started with the organization in the fall of 2016, and the organization started officially in 2014 as a nonprofit and 2012 as a dinner series. Um, so it was actually started by a group of fishermen, scientists, and chefs. Um, and they started what was called the Eating with the Ecosystem Dinners, which were these fun educational events to try to get people to diversify their diets and tell the story of the local fisher fisheries and the ecosystems. Um, but yeah, we've definitely seen changes over time. I see a lot more um, chefs starting to utilize some of the species, like serving whole scup on high-end menus or like uh, the, oh, you never used to like see. Um, I also see, um, I, I just see a lot more like species just kind of more readily available it when you walk into a, even a grocery store I've been able to find monkfish you know at a market basket or like a um, stop and shop before and things like that so like that's really cool to see uh, most of the time the grocery stores are kind of the slowest that come along, <laughs> um, in terms of um, making changes so to start to see those at more mainstream grocery stores is really exciting uh, and we ran a citizen science project a couple of years ago uh, that was called our Eat Like a Fish Citizen Science Project, where we had 86 citizen scientists from all over New England, um, all the New England coastal states, I'll say. Um, so Vermont, we didn't have any participants, but we had people from all, all of the New England coastal states. And every week for six months, I sent them a fish list of four randomly generated species out of 56 possible ones. And everybody got a different list. And each week they had to visit fish markets looking for their fish and record their experience. First of all, they found the fish or not, but then it record their experience purchasing it. And then if they actually purchased, found it, purchased it, their experience cooking and eating the fish at home and serving it to their families. Um, and we basically created a bunch of like eating the ecosystem ambassadors through that project, kind of in, unintentionally. We went, we set out to collect data on the availability of the species in the marketplace. Um, and we really saw it's such, like such great um, impact from People spread out all across the region, but just going into markets every week and asking for these different local species. And maybe it was just one person in one, you know, small neighborhood in New Hampshire or, or Connecticut or wherever, but just them going in on a regular basis and asking for different species like whiting or skate or razor clams or whatever was actually influencing the markets that the like carrying those species and so that was really cool and like unexpected feedback to hear back and so I, I would say like 
you as a consumer can actually have a great impact just by asking for species on a regular basis. Yeah, Amanda. We try to have a list going on our website. It can be hard because obviously like seafood availability changes throughout the season and you know, like it can change day to day um, and stuff. But we do have a list on our website of like, we have a what, like what's local page and then find like local seafood page on our website. Um, and we try to link to other lists. So we link, for example, to the Rhode Island Seafood Finder um, and that will link a bunch of different local retail markets um, and restaurants like that that are serving different Rhode Island seafood species. Um, so that's a good place to start. Yeah, that's see well. Um, we don't have, I guess, that list. Yeah, maybe that's something we should create. It's a good suggest. Oh, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Um, he asked if there was a list of, um, of like, basically like retail outlets at the port or at the dock um, that you can purchase kind of seafood. And he gave the example of Stonington, Connecticut, having this freezer and a self serve box. Um, so that's see well seafood, and it, I think it used to be what was this? scallop boat i forgot the name of the scallop boat the bombster is who it used to be in stonington now it's sea well seafood um and they're that's such a cool thing um but um we don't have a list of those type of places i guess on our website yet it's probably something i should add so that's a great suggestion maybe it's something we'll work on um but I, there are certain fisheries and fishermen that can sell their fish direct to the public um if you you know go down to point judith you'll see it mostly with lobster crabs um that's probably most most prevalent but there are fishermen that have what they call like their direct sales dealer's license and they can sell their fish fin fish whole direct to the public so they're not going to sell you filet but they can sell you a whole fish which i highly encourage you using um, and we have a lot of resources on our website for how to actually if you want to fillet your fish or how to cook it whole and stuff um, but yeah they're something maybe we'll add those <laughs> I think that's the same here also. Yeah, um, it's, I think the, I guess, impetus behind it is to protect the commercial industry, uh, but it, it does become such a waste um, and it's a, it's a tough one to kind of tackle. Um, but again, sorry, I didn't repeat it again, but he asked about um, like charter boats and leftover fish being, they can only be donated, they can't be sold. Um, kind of thing and so a lot of times um, it is it's a challenge because trying to protect the commercial industry um, but at the same time it, it, it's sad to see fish go to waste um, we've been part of a seafood donation program in Rhode Island um, that is with the commercial fishery center of Rhode Island leads it and we're a partner on the project and it's been mostly purchasing fish directly from the fishermen um, through grant funding and then donating it to people that are experiencing food insecurity um, kind of within the state um, but they also have been able to work with, um, for example, research cruises um, and get some research fish that normally would be going to waste and donate that. So maybe it's something that like, we potentially could incorporate in that way. Yeah, George. 